Good evening, Chernobyl enthusiasts of the interwebs. I'm Alexa, resident Yuki Spooky Girly, and today we're diving into one of the most devastating historical events in relatively recent history. Granted, I wasn't alive when this happened, but my parents and grandparents were. So, question for you: Where were you when everything was happening? Let me know in the comments. And welcome to the top five disturbing Chernobyl discoveries scientists can no longer ignore. Number five: Don't eat the food. That might be common sense to most of us, but if I've learned anything in my time here on Earth, it's that common sense ain't all too common anymore. Sad as I might be to utter that statement. So. Let's just say I know a human who has recently visited Chernobyl, and even though they're a brilliant human being, decided to pick an apple off of a tree and consume it. So while I'm thrilled to hear that vegetation is making a comeback in the area, trust me when I say I was making a million Snow White jokes while also concerned for my friend's health. They're not a daredevil per se, but we've made enough Johnny Knoxville jokes together and met through doing work that definitely isn't for everybody. But they're also one of the toughest people I know. I'm just happy to report that the damn apple apparently just tasted really off and made them up chuck like no tomorrow. Which sure, that could trigger a no SHIT Sherlock response for most of us, but maybe there will eventually come a day where it's safe to consume from the land there. But not anytime soon, so if you're visiting, leave the apples on the tree. Number 4. Thyroid Cancer Cancers are caused by mutations in human DNA. A few lines of genetic code get deleted or mixed up, and that change allows cells to proliferate and grow in abnormal ways. Sometimes those DNA changes are genetic. You know, people inherit them. People inherit them from their parents, but sometimes they're caused by environmental factors. For years, epidemiological studies have shown that thyroid cancer is particularly common among people exposed to radioactive iodine, especially for folks who were exposed when they were young. At high enough doses, radioactive iodine kills thyroid cells can actually be used as a treatment for thyroid cancer and other thyroid conditions. But the radiation from Chernobyl wasn't enough to kill cells. Instead, the months long exposure to lower doses caused changes to the cells that resulted in tumors. Now, In her paper, lead researcher Lindsay Morton and her colleagues were able to take a closer look at the tumors from people who lived near Chernobyl, studying the DNA of over 350 people who developed thyroid cancer after being exposed to radiation when they were young. Through this, they created a comprehensive molecular picture of said tumors. Then, to see how they differed from thyroid cancers caused by other factors, the researchers compared these tumors against tissue from 81 people who were born near Chernobyl after 1986 and developed thyroid cancer but were never exposed to radiation. They also compared the tumors to data from the Cancer Genome Atlas, which has characterized the genomes of thousands of cancers. I found that the cancer cases caused by radioactive iodine exposure following the meltdown had mutated genes by rupturing the twin strands of DNA and breaking them apart. By contrast, the thyroid cancers in the Cancer Genome Atlas and in the control group of 81 unexposed people from the area were more likely to be caused by single point mutations, where just one single base pair of the DNA is changed. After the disaster, scientists monitored many of the communities near Chernobyl, as well as the workers who were tasked with cleaning up and encasing the radioactive reactor in a steel and concrete sarcophagus. Researchers also did extensive interviews with residents about their indirect exposure. For example, radioactive isotopes from the reactor fell into the surrounding fields and were eaten by grazing cows, transmitting the radiation to their milk and subsequently to the people who drank it. So information about dairy consumption offered clues about how much radiation someone had been exposed to. Physicists and epidemiologists worked together to piece all these direct and indirect measurements into a reconstruction of the radiation doses that the people who donated the tissue samples would have received. Now, This is a unique circumstance where we know a lot about the exposure. Most of the genome landscape studies have no information on where and what the people were exposed to. So this gave researchers an opportunity to take a close look at exactly how this cancer process works. They discovered that the more radiation a person was exposed to and the younger they were at the time of exposure, the more double strand DNA breaks they would have. Finally, the team looked at the cancer drivers, the specific genes whose mutations were responsible for tumor growth. They found that the molecular characteristics of the radiation caused cancers weren't all that different from what has been observed in randomly occurring thyroid cancers. It was only you know, those double strand DNA breaks that was different. That's what really was the insight into how radiation is causing cancer. There were no special biomarkers that labeled these cells as having been mutated by radiation, which tells scientists that the effects of the radiation happened early in the carcinogenic process and the biomarkers, if there were any, were lost or washed out as the cancer grew. That molecular similarity indicates that these cases don't require a novel treatment. These cancers really just look, in the end, like typical thyroid cancers, so there are no specific implications for taking a different treatment approach. The more you know. Number 3. Genetics of Dogs Left Behind So a population of wild dogs living near the Chernobyl exclusion zone is now giving scientists a glimpse into how long term radiation exposure affects generations. So yes, this kind of plays into what I was just talking about. The radiation exposure still being emitted in Chernobyl decades after the 1986 nuclear disaster may have fundamentally altered the genetics of dog populations, according to a study published earlier this year in science advances. Furthermore, the genetics within dog populations that have been exposed to differing levels of radiation are also distinct from one another, according to researchers. The dogs still living around the exclusion zone are likely descendants of the pets left behind after residents surrounding the power plant fled the region in a hurry, leaving behind all their belongings, including their four-legged companions. The radioactive contamination devastated wildlife populations in the region, but some survived and continued to breed. Researchers used preserved, you know, redness samples collected from more than 300 dogs between 
2017 and 2019 in a location with varying levels of contamination by the Chernobyl Dog Research Initiative, as the organization has been providing veterinary care, according to the study. The volunteers began treating and sterilizing the dogs around the same time that construction began for the new safe confinement facility for the nuclear reactor that failed, and there was concern that the dogs living in the area might be a problem. Apparently, they're super friendly. Many of the effects that researchers have seen in the dogs and other animals parallel what has been observed in the past with you know atomic survivors from Japan. I can't say the word. For instance, they have increased rates of cataracts because the eyes are the first tissues to show signs of chronic exposure to ionizing radiation. Scientists are also looking for other developmental abnormalities, such as tumors, smaller brain sizes, and changes in symmetry. The researchers aim to distinguish the different populations of dogs that live in and near the power plant as well as in Pripyat, the abandoned town about two miles away. The dogs that live in Chernobyl City have a background of Boxer and Rottweiler, while the dogs in Slavutich have more Labrador Retriever in them. Why genomic variations within and across geographic locations across the Chernobyl exclusion zone suggest the dogs live close to one another, move between sites, and breed freely? Researchers are now poised to determine the genetic progressions of the dogs in the past several generations and look at how they have survived and propagated throughout that time. Although exposure to ionizing radiation is known to elevate genetic mutation rates across various plant and animal species, it is still unclear how larger animals may be impacted at the population level. Even in the shadow of war, researchers and volunteers were able to venture into Chernobyl to treat about 125 animals and obtain more samples, which I guess we'll find out. Number two, elephant foot. So this is a solidified corium glass composed primarily of silicon dioxide with traces of dissolved uranium, titanium, zirconium, magnesium, and graphite. It was formed during the Chernobyl disaster, you know, from a lava-like mixture. It was formed during the Chernobyl disaster from a lava-like mixture of molten core materials that had escaped the reactor enclosure. Materials from the reactor itself and various structural components of the plant itself, such as concrete and metal. Over time, zircon crystals have started to form slowly within the mass as it cools, and crystalline uranium dioxide dendrites are growing quickly and breaking down repeatedly. Despite the distribution of uranium-bearing particles not being uniform, the radioactivity of the mass is evenly distributed. The mass was quite dense and unyielding to efforts to collect samples for analysis by a drill mounted on a remote-controlled trolley and armor-piercing rounds fired from an AK-47 were necessary to break off usable chunks. By June of 1998, the outer layers had started turning to dust, and the mass had started to crack, as the radioactive components were starting to disintegrate to a point where the structural integrity of the glass was failing. In 2021, the mass was described as having a similar consistency to sand. It is named for its wrinkly appearance, you know, kind of like an elephant's foot. So what was it this thing was discovered, by the way? Back in December of 1986, it is located in room 217, 15 meters to the southeast of the ruined reactor, and 6 meters below ground level. The material making up the foot had burnt through at least 2 meters of reinforced concrete, then flowed through pipes and fissures and down a hallway to reach its current location. So now it's located in a maintenance corridor below the remains of reactor number 4, though the visible elephant's foot is only a part of a larger mass. By the way, it's still an extremely radioactive object, even though the danger has decreased over time due to the decay of its radioactive components. But according to my sources, it's still pretty lethal. Don't go near that. At the time of its discovery, which was about 8 months after formation, radioactivity near the elephant's foot was approximately 8,000 to 10,000 uh, rogens, or 80 to 100 grays per hour, delivering a 50-50 lethal dose of radiation within 5 minutes. Now since that time, the radiation intensity has declined significantly, and in 1996, the elephant's foot was briefly visited by the deputy director of the new safe confinement project, who took photographs using an automatic camera and a flashlight to eliminate the otherwise dark room. Now how does it give off radiation? Alpha particles. As of 2015, measurements of a piece taken from the foot indicated radioactivity levels of roughly 2500 BQ. While alpha radiation is ordinarily unable to penetrate the skin, it is the most damaging form of radiation when radioactive particles are inhaled or ingested, which has renewed concerns as samples of material from the meltdown, including the foot, kind of turn to dust and become aerosols. So wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask. Number one, reactor four. So while there are parts of Chernobyl that can now be visited by tourists, there's still a whole lot of area that is completely off limits. Also, if you're visiting as a tourist, it's recommended that you wear clothes that you don't mind burning after your visit, that you don't get infected. So you can actually visit the control room from reactor four, but the radiation in the room is 40,000 times higher than normal levels. It sits under the, it sits under the new containment arch, but outside of it, the original sarcophagus that contained the radiation of the reactor itself. Now, if you're going to visit the site, you got to wear a protective suit, a helmet, a mask, and you got to be there five minutes or less. Afterwards, you got to go radiology tests, a couple of them, to measure the amount of radiation that you were exposed to. Which that's kind of typical of most tours in Chernobyl. People must go through radiation checkpoints at the beginning, middle, and end of one-day tours. Because if you didn't know, if I haven't been clear enough today, exposure to large amounts of radiation can cause tissue damage and acute sickness, as well as cancer. One area that you absolutely cannot enter: the machine cemetery in the Rosoka village, which is where the contaminated machines used during the cleanup were dumped. Yeah, that's not at the top of my must-see list anytime soon. And that brings us to the end of our time. And I think I'll just stick to seeing photos and videos from Chernobyl instead of going there myself. If you enjoyed my ramblings today, could you help us out by giving this video a like, subscribing if you aren't already, hit the bell for more disturbing content from us here at Tom Five Scary Videos, and I'll see y'all next time, you lovely spooky people.